All right, so I'm going to be presenting on subaxial cervical spine trauma. Um, so here's my outline. Um, we'll start with just some epidemiology and anatomy. Uh, so the subaxial cervical spine extends from C3 to C7. It's divided into subaxial motion segments uh, made of two adjacent vertebrae connected together with the intervertebral disc, as well as posterior arch, the ligaments, and the uncovertebral joints, as well as the facet joints. Uh, in the subaxial spine, the facet joints are at a 45 degree angle. Uh, and this inclination does increase from C7 going up to C3. There are multiple ways to divide the subaxial spine. Uh, again, there's a two column theory, a three column theory. Uh, Holsworth divided the C spine into segments of two columns, so the anterior and posterior. So on the right, you can see the, the anterior column includes the ALL, the annulus, the vertebral bodies, the transverse processes, uh, the PLL, as well as the uncopotebral joints. And then the posterior column is the facets, the ligaments, uh, the ligamentum flavum, the pedicles, the lamina, uh, the spinous processes, as well as the, the posterior ligamentous structures. So in regards to stability, the, the anterior column involves the majority of the discal ligamentous com complex, the DLC. And then the posterior column involves the facet joints as well as the, again, the posterior ligamentous structures. Um, so speaking of classification, uh, C-spine fractures, uh, and fracture dislocations are very heterogeneous in pattern and mechanism and so they, they can be difficult to classify and there's multiple different classification systems um, treatment is typically based on a number of variables including fracture pattern mechanism uh, overall alignment neurologic injury stability and then kind of a combination of all these factors that you need to take in, in, into account so there's a lot of classification systems that try and distill all this information down into like a, a recommendation or or some sort of stability classification. Just talking about two, um, I'd like to talk about ESLIC and the AO spine classification. Uh, so ESLIC uh, was developed in 2007 uh, from a sp spine trauma study group. Uh, this was a combination of literature review and a retrospective review as well as expert opinion. Um, that then they apply to cases. So it looks at morphology, uh, the disco ligamentous complex, as well as neurologic status. There are some modifications to TLIX, um, specifically some morphology um, is very similar, but it looks at the spinal column disruption uh, available on, on the imaging studies. Uh, integrity of the DLC is represented by both anterior and posterior structures, um, as well as the disc. And then again, neurostatus is uh, very important in determining uh, treatment. Specifically with morphology, you can, uh, from zero or one point is uh, compression, so height loss, either part or the entire vertebral body, um, disruption through an end plate, um, any kind of compression. Um, these can also include non-displaced or minimally displaced uh, lateral mass fractures. The burst is a little more severe, um, so it's fractured through the entire vertebral body. Uh, going into the posterior wall. And then again, distraction is dissociation along the vertical axis. Um, so you get ligamentous disruption, uh, disruption of the DLC, um, possible posterior element compression. And then translation or translocation, it also includes rotation. It would be like a facet dislocation, um, separation of lateral masses or bilateral pedicle fractures. Uh, the DLC is a little different than in the uh, TLIX classification. So looking at this, the, D, uh, the DLC provides restraint against deforming forces um, and provides a lot of stability. Um, so integrity can, can be looked at through both x-rays and CT and to see if there's any widening of the inner spinous distance, dislocation of the sets, uh, subluxation of vertebral bodies, um, or just widening of the disc space. And then the conclusions of the of the study were that again, if if it's less than or three or less, um, you can potentially treat this non-operatively. If it's four, it could go either way. And then if it's five or more, um, it probably should be operatively managed. Um, but again, we kind of saw a couple of weeks ago. If, if you're trying to look up an SLIC score and it's 3 a.m. and you're on call, it's probably going to be a four. <laughs> Uh, there have been retrospective reviews to look at the ESLIC scoring system and to see if it uh, is reproducible and useful. Um, and they did 
Uh, so Samuel looked at 185 consecutive patients, and they found that patients uh, with an SLIC score of three or less, 94% were managed non-operatively. When they were a four, uh, about 65% were managed non-surgically, 45% uh, were managed surgically, and then if they were five or more, 95% uh, were managed surgically. So it is very good if you have a three or a five is saying yes, uh, surgery or no, this person doesn't need surgery. But again, that kind of four is a sort of middle gray zone for SLIC. And moving on to AO spine, uh, this was more recently developed uh, and they wanted to focus a little bit more on injury morphology and so to maybe break down that kind of gray period or gray area in SLIC uh, that's a four. Uh, specifically the morphology again compression uh, you can get facet injuries and then they are still looking at neurologic status but they they also add in case specific modifiers so things that would kind of push your hand towards operative management such as uh, there's a disc herniation or there's uh, some sort of ankylosis um, or vertebral artery anomalies uh, specifically looking at the morphology because i think this is where it differs the most um, so type a's in the ao classification are the compression injuries so a0 is some sort of non-structural fracture and then a1 through 3 are a compression injury to the vertebral body uh, increasing in severity as you go down now the b's are a failure of the posterior or anterior tension band through distraction uh, so physical separation of the subaxial elements without any translocation or, or rotation and then C is displacement uh, translocation of one vertebral body relative to the other. Uh, F, they also add in just specific classification for facet injuries. You can get non-displaced fractures all the way up into a perched or dislocated facet. Um, overall, the, the classification system is reliable and reproducible. Um, so some subsets of injuries specifically like the B types um, have a little bit lower reliability, but several studies have shown that the AO spine has improved reliability, at least over the SLIC, um, although again, both are used or can be used. Uh, so initial ass assessment and imaging, uh, of course, ATLS, so you're getting the you know airway breathing, C spine and circulation. Specifically with the cervical spine, again, you're looking at are there uh, in a cervical posture or some sort of uh, rigid deformity that may clue you off that they have some sort of fracture or facet dislocation. Um, and then you you also want to be very careful if they have any of these conditions uh, like ankylosing spondylitis, dish, um, cervical spine fusion, or any kind of ligaments laxity uh, that they may have more than what they appear to have. Non-contiguous in injuries are very common as well. 10 to 15% of patients that have a sp spine injury have a non-contiguous fracture somewhere else. Uh, so be very, very careful to look for those. Specifically looking at imaging, uh, x-rays, the lateral C-spine is a quick way to look at overall alignment. It, you can look at disc height, uh, changes in the interspinous distances, um, but it's not, not the most sensitive or specific. Um, several studies saw that it only had anywhere from 30 to 60 percent sensitivity in evaluating for subaxial spine fractures. And so CT is, is the gold standard. Again, it's 99 to 100 percent sensitive and specific depending on where you look. Um, and most people coming in the trauma bay are probably going to get a C-spine CT depending on the, the mechanism and, and their complaints. Uh, MRI is, is pretty interesting. It's a little more muddy though. Uh, so an MRI screening with a, a patient with a normal CT and no neuro deficits did add uh, injuries in 20, 21% of the cases, but none of those injuries required surgery and none of them were deemed unstable. So this, there's a meta-analysis uh, from 2015 that looked at uh, adding an MRI to these patients with a normal cervical spine CT and it did not miss any significant injuries and there was no a change in management in these patients at least. But in setting of a fracture, uh, an MRI did provide additional information. So uh, almost half the time, the MRI changed management, uh, 
a quarter of the time it went from non-operative management to operative management. And so an MRI in the cases of uh, older patients, patients that are uptunded, patients with uh, spondylosis or any kind of neuro deficit or a known fracture uh, will be very useful for preoperative planning. And then CT angiography, again, that allows for uh, evaluation of vertebral arteries. So if you have a fracture in the transverse foramen, um, or you're concerned for any kind of vertebral injury, a CT angio would be reasonable. Uh, so I wanted to hit uh, steroids briefly to, in terms of spinal cord injury. Uh, so the NASIS trials, there was three of them. They looked at were steroids helpful in preventing spinal cord injury. Uh, NASIS-1 compared low-dose versus high-dose methylprednisone. Um, they demonstrated no difference between the groups, uh, although they did find that a majority of patients had improved motor scores. But there were statistically higher rates of wound infections, uh, sepsis, PE, with the high-dose groups. Uh, NASIS-2, kind of a follow-up. They didn't find a difference between methylprednisone, naloxone, and placebo. Uh, in overall in their groups. But when they did a post hoc analysis, um, it showed that they did get some modest improvement if the steroids were given early, so before eight hours, compared to receiving them after eight hours. And then NASIS 3 looked at the difference between uh, 24 and 48 hours of steroid. Uh, post hoc, they found some motor improvements in those who received early infusion, so uh, consistent with NASIS 2. Um, but prolonged steroid use was associated with complications, specifically pneumonia. So kind of where we are today, these are fairly controversial studies. There's a lot of uh, data that looks at these and kind of refutes them or backs them up. At least right now, uh, the AO spine guidelines, uh, specifically talking about methylprednisolone, say that there's, they don't think there's a difference in the motor score change at any time point in steroid versus no steroid. But when you give the steroid early, so within eight hours, um, they, there are modest improvements in mean motor scores. Uh, so they recommend uh, not offering any steroids if the pr patient presents after eight hours uh, with an acute spinal cord injury. Although if they present within eight hours, they suggest a 24-hour infusion of the high-dose methylprednisolone. Uh, they don't suggest the 48-hour infusion, as this, again, was associated more with more complications. So I want to go into some morphology specifically and kind of talk about specific types of fractures. Um, so specifically the uh, burst fracture morphology or an AO pattern A or an s look kind of get either a 1 or a 2 with these. Um, uh, but maybe a zero for the discal ligamentous complex. Neurologic stats becomes very important in this case um, because they're either like an s lick maybe two, and then neurostatus could push you up to a four or above. In terms of management of these, uh, you can treat these non-operatively if they're stable, they're mild compression fractures. Again, if you have intact posterior ligaments and, and no evidence of kyphosis. But things that would push you towards operative management would be any kind of unstable fracture or any kind of neurologic deficit or spinal cord compression. Suggestions for treatment would be an anterior vertebral body resection and stabilization. So again, you want to remove the, either the retropulse bone or fragments that are compressing the canal or cord. And then reconstruct and stabilize it with either a strut graft, a cage, or an anterior locking plate, or, or both. Um, Given that most of the pathology is or almost always anterior, uh, typically this is an anterior approach, and you're rarely re required to go posterior for these. Uh, I, I did want to highlight the difference between a flexion teardrop and an extension teardrop. Um, so flexion teardrops is an anterior column fa failure in compression, along with a posterior column failure in tension. Uh, there's a large anterior lip fragment. Uh, could be called a quadrangular fracture. Uh, this is highly associated with spinal cord injury as well as posterior retropulsion. Uh, these type of injuries are very unstable and are surgically managed. Extension teardrops uh, is usually a smaller avulsion of the anterior end plate, smaller fleck of bone. Most can be stable um, and can be treated as a cervical collar, uh, 
but there are unstable variants of this. Again, if there's a very large fragment, if there's any kind of displacement or angulation, or if there's uh, injury to the DLC or neurodeficit, then you would consider operative stabilization for these. Um, and it would be very uh, similar, uh, potentially requiring posterior as well as anterior approach. Uh, facet dislocations. Uh, so the superior facet, basically, or this is when the superior facet lies anterior to the infer inferior facet, or the kind of reverse hamburger sign. Uh, facet dis dislocations can be either unilateral or bilateral. Uh, bilateral ones are associated with more severe ligamentous and soft tissue disruption. Uh, and then acute disc herniations have also been reported uh, with about 50% rate uh, in facet dislocations. Uh, so there is some controversy whether uh, the timing of reduction of the facets and whether to obtain a pre-reduction MRI. Um, some have advocated it's okay to pr proceed without an MRI um, if the patient's awake and cooperative, although I, there's also a lot of studies that say you should get the MRI first uh, before reduction. Uh, again, to look for those uh, herniated discs. So there's this usually significant soft tissue injury with facet dislocations. Um, leading to very in, unstable spine. Uh, you can treat these uh, non-operatively, um, but there are some studies that show a very high incidence of uh, recurrent instability, pain after uh, treating these non-operatively. And so a majority of these I've seen were, were treated operatively. Uh, fixation strategies, um, you can do, you know, uh, Oh uh, yeah, sorry, bilateral facet dislocation. So if you have a bilateral facet dislocation, you get injury to much more soft tissue structures, so anterior and posterior, interspinous longitudinal ligaments, your facet capsules, your posterior annulus. Uh, these are very unstable. Treatment for this, again, you want to get a closed reduction. Uh, in order to get a closed reduction, this is either with manual traction, either closed or open. Um, you can apply up to 80% of the person's body weight is what I've read, with or without uh, sedation. Long-term management, they, these were treated in HALO, but they had a very high incidence of recurrent subluxation and dislocation, uh, just given the instability of the subaxial cervical spine. Kind of, and so uh, operative management is recommended. Uh, you can do multiple approaches. You can approach these anteriorly which is beneficial because you can remove a large retropulse terminated disc uh, before reduction or distraction. Uh, this also gives you the ability to recreate uh, the lower doses of the cervical spine, and you have higher fusion rates with an anterior approach. Um, posterior treatment can also be done, uh, specifically if there's no, no evidence of a disc herniation. Uh, you can also reduce from posteriorly uh, by exaggerating the deformity and then manipulating the, the facets uh, back into place. Uh, and then again, you, you fuse this with lateral mass screws. Combined approaches, again, are, can also be done. They offer better stability, uh, higher fusion rates, um, but they are more morbid. But they may be necessary if there's a uh, comminution or, or complex fractures. Uh, interestingly, again, you can have a lot of fractures around the subaxial spine without dislocation. Uh, specifically just like the set fractures or uh, inferior superior articular process fractures without dislocation. Um, literature looking at this show that they did worse with non-operative management uh, in terms of failure of non-operative management, continued pain, lower functional scores, and then increased kyphosis. Um, and so you can choose to treat these again if they're stable non-operatively but uh, it, it was recommended to uh, repeat imaging uh, constantly and to try and, and then you're going to be really looking at these uh, critically throughout multiple time points and not just kind of gray set and forget it you know these if you're treating a fracture like this uh, you're gonna be watching it closely Uh, and then briefly, I want to talk about spinal cord injury, but I, di I didn't want to hit all the incomplete cord injuries, but central cord is very common, uh, or the most common incomplete cord injury, so I wanted to hit that. Um, again, it's 
typically the upper extremities and the hand are involved uh, preferentially, and that's due to the, uh, the shape and the distribution of the nerves within the lateral cortical spinal tract. Overall, these do have a good prognosis, uh, but full functional recovery is rare. Current recommendations um, are to allow for permissive hypertension for a week. So MAP goals uh, anywhere from 85 to 90. There's no recommendation for steroids in this case. Um, in terms of surgery or, no, or non-surgical treatment, there is some controversy. Or controversy. The surgery does lead to shorter hospital stay and a faster return to neurologic baseline, but long-term studies didn't show a significant difference in, in neurologic recovery. Uh, so you would consider surgery if you had any mechanical instability, ongoing cord compression, uh, and then surgical management is, uh, would be your would be your treatment. Whether going anterior or posterior um, for these again would depend on your fracture morphology. Overall, uh, complications and outcomes of uh, surgically managed uh, subaxial cervical spine fractures. Again, 88% five-year survival. Uh, risk factor for mortality would be very old, advanced aged, uh, severe head injury, or severe spinal cord injury, which you can imagine is pretty pretty obvious, I guess. Neurologic function, it can improve uh, to Asia grades in about 20% of people. Half in, in, uh, improve some form of Asia grades. And then 89% uh, do have improvement in their reticular symptoms. In terms of pain, most patients were doing well uh, afterwards with a VAS of one on average, and then the majority of patients managed operatively, uh, had bony union infusion. Uh, so to conclude, uh, knowing the anatomy is very important and knowing what makes the subaxial spine different uh, can help guide your imaging and treatment. Uh, first, to know what to do, you got to classify the injury. So you're going to need both an exam and good imaging studies to classify it. And then your initial management, again, with ATLS, uh, immobilization, very important. But then surgical indications, you would have to have a good classification and then surgically indicate these patients and implement that uh, surgery with the goals of treatment being, again, our AO principles, maxim maximize neurologic recovery, uh, achieve anatomic reduction, and potentially fusion, and then provide stable spine, or provide a stable spine for early rehab. All right, thanks so much, and uh, happy Halloween. <laughs>
we were talking about. Yeah, for early, early uh, injury. You know, if you if you get to them early, and there's some good data to to support that, according to him. And so he'll do it for 24 hours. Yep, if it's before eight hours. Uh, okay. You know, Greg, I you know I think one of the hardest things and 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 a very common thing that we see, and Resin did a great job with with this talk. Correct. Congratulations on this, but. Central cord injury, and what's the what's your algorithm? What's your protocol for central cord? And when do you give steroids? When do you do early surgery? Do, do you wait for the plateau? Um, does it matter if they have bladder involvement? Do, does that change your algorithm at all? So uh, for me, so at Scripps, we don't like at the trauma center where we do most of these. There is not an algorithmic approach to it. It's really surgeon dependent. So. But for me personally, um, I will go to the OR as quick as I can. So I, I feel like early decompression is the right answer. And I think the data seems to support that more and more. Um, I have not adopted the use of steroids in the setting of central cord syndrome. But, you know, if someone can tell me, show me that that's the right thing, um, apart from spinal cord injury, then I mean from, you know, a traumatic spinal cord injury like a, you know, burst fracture in a 26 year old, you know, I, again, I'm, I'm, I feel like I, we want to be as data driven as possible. And if that's the right move, then I would certainly, um, uh, you know, bring it up in front of our trauma panel and discuss with them. But, um, <clears throat> what do you do, Rick? Are you, are you in favor of steroids and surgery or what are your, and what are your thoughts? If it's early, because I think yeah, it's early syndrome, I mean, it's a spinal cord injury, right? It's a very, very specific right. type of spinal cord injury. And so if we see it before eight hours, I will give steroids. Um, I do think that I, I do give them a, a, a short period of time to see if they recover, because many times they do. And sometimes it can be really, really quick. Um, and I do not like to operate on someone who is getting better. Um, I'd much rather see them plateau. But I think that and the, I think some of the literature does support this. If they have bladder involvement, if if their bladder doesn't work, that's a really bad prognostic indicator, and would yeah. make me uh, take them to the operating room uh, sooner than later. Do you, so do you feel that? Because okay, so it's back real quick on the steroid thing. Because one of the problems is that we're calling all traumas the same thing, right? Whether it's a uh, you know, a, a brown saccard versus a central cord versus a anterior spinal, et cetera, et cetera, right? And we're just, we clump them all and say, give steroids. But I would think that, you know, just mechanistically, that if you have a low, a low um, uh, uh, mechanism, right? Like a surfer, like is what we see a lot of is like 50 and 60 year olds body surfing or surfing for the first time from out of town and they whip their neck. So if you have that guy versus a guy that gets into, you know, on a motorcycle going 60 miles an hour, I feel like the mechanism is different in one versus the other. Do you, do you feel that, you know, steroid use in one versus another? Like one's like almost like a, degener a degenerative process that got an acute injury. The other one is like, you know, they had a ton of energy go through their spinal cord. Um, does that have any impact? I mean, should we be treating them differently? Well, that's a great question, Greg. And, and, you know, I, I certainly don't have the answer. I don't have the answer, but certainly that's, I think. A, you know what I'm saying? Like from an inflammatory cascade standpoint, the guy that's getting in a 60 mile an hour injury, that that collision has to generate a, not, not just over the spinal cord, but a systemic response, right? Which is where you see a lot of the downsides for the steroids. I just feel like in a central cord, like, I don't know, because there's not such a robust, massive inflammatory response from the entire system, the entire body, that maybe steroids are not as not as big of a problem in that setting versus a guy that's gonna have you know major issues from his massive inflammatory response. Yeah, I don't know. Good point. Great point. Yeah, I agree with that, Greg. And then what do you do with stingers, right? I mean, that's a personal subject now, isn't it? I know, Daggum it. What do you do with stingers, Rick? I got my my kid has a recurrent stinger, and I kept him out for two weeks. And he had a he had weakness in his bicep and his deltoid, and you know, uh, def definitely had the real deal. Yeah, so kept him out for two weeks, and he's first, he's back to normal now. 
but like, what do we do? It's 16. So if, it, if, if it's recurrent or if it's prolonged, and yours uh, son sound like it was prolonged more than five minutes, um, you really need to make sure that it's, it, you make sure he doesn't have a cervical spine problem. And stingers and burners, you know, can be either due to nerve root or plexus. You know, traditionally, at least in my teeth, you know, how I learned that, you know, these stingers and burners were plexus injuries, but they can be radicular injuries and it's difficult or impossible to distinguish them clinically. So if they are recurrent or they last a long time, they absolutely need an MRI scan of their cervical spine to make sure they don't have any intracanal or foraminal problems. Yeah. Okay. But I think that, that's the first thing. Otherwise, if it, if it is a plexus injury, um, you know, they they should be fine. They they should absolutely be fine unless they, I mean, the hard ones are if they have profound weakness for a significant period of time. And those are, I, I, those are very controversial. I mean, obviously you can't let them go back to play with significant weakness, but once right. their yeah, we'll weakness resolves, and especially if it's recurrent, what do you tell them? And yeah. That's hard. Well, I told my kid he gets one more try and he's done. Yeah. So, like, <laughs> it's not worth it. So. Agreed. Dr. Sasso, when you said that this is Amber, one of the fellows, you said uh, that you wait a certain period of time for your central cords. Um, how, how long is is an appropriate time to wait for them so, to get better? Yeah. So what I when I say wait, it's it's not a long time. It's it's hours. So many times these central cord uh, syndromes improve really quickly. Um, in front of your eyes and, and the families and the patients will tell you also, you know, initially, you know, I, I couldn't feel my hands at all. I, I, I couldn't move my arms. My legs were also, but my legs, usually their legs start coming back first. And many times that's just asking them when you see them, yeah, are you improving or are you not? Yes, I'm improving. Well, then I will watch them, watch them for a few hours and maybe even overnight, see them the next morning. How are you compared to last night? And as long as they continue to improve, either subjectively or objectively with, with improved mu muscle strength, I will watch them. If they, if they stop improving though, as, and if they plateau, and especially if you can determine that, that they have involvement, if, if their bladder's not working well, um, either you know, post-void post residual or bladder scans that you can do right there in the ER, um, then I, I agree with Greg, then, then I take them to the operating room um, uh, once they plateau. And that can be the next day even. Okay, thank you. Do you in general, do you in general take them all back at some point? Um, not if they get all their function back. I mean, so, some okay. some get, get everything back. Um, I certainly have seen that a, a number of times. And, and, and they, but then, you know, <laughs> Then you have the issue of, okay, now you have a guy who has underlying, obviously, cervical right. stenosis. Uh, he's had a significant neurologic event. And then what do you tell him about future activities or the potential that he may develop this again or may develop myelopathy? I mean, re really, I mean, myelopathy is a spinal cord injury, right? Uh, I right. think the cord syndrome is just <laughs> myelopathy that it occurs more acutely than we usually see myelopathy. Yeah, because I tend to, I tend to, even on those that recover, I tend to tell them like, you know, put it on your, on your to-do list for the year. That's usually what I tell them, you know, um, I, I, I personally just, I'm, I'm risk averse, which and to me, you know, surgery is being risk averse in this setting, you know, like, Stabilize the segment, you know, especially if it's not a huge segment, you know, get it fixed and go back to, you know, surfing, whatever you want to do. But if it's from an you know, isolated disc, it's obviously one thing. If it's from an entire subaxial spine that looks horrible, then that's another, but that's a, that's a separate talk. So yeah, I mean, well, awesome, guys. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Rick. Well, I was just going to say, it, it, you know, we see patients who 
it, it, we get to this point where you, you have radiographic stenosis, significant narrowing, but in a patient who's asymptomatic and has no signs or symptoms of myelopathy, what do you tell them? Yeah. yeah and they already had a central cord? Uh, let's say they didn't. Do you, oh. do you treat those differently? Yeah, I do. I don't. I don't yeah. treat them. Follow them with MJOAs, you know, see them yeah, at interval. Right. And if they're stable, they're stable. Although, you know, this whole thing about early myelopathy, now that's coming out. I, yeah. I worry about that a little bit, but I think it's a bit aggressive. I tend to I tend to watch people a little bit more. How about you, Rick? You operate pretty quick if you see I, radiographic. I have an algorithm. I mean, if they, if they have intrinsic cord change, I operate on them. And by that, you mean if they have myelomalacia? Uh, if they have intrinsic cord change, yeah. I, but I don't know what that intrinsic cord change is. Is it really myelomalacia? Is it really intrinsic malacia of the spinal cord, or is it edema? Is it edema that may be reversible, and if I decompress them? So I, that's why I like to, to use the term intrinsic cord change, because I, okay. I can't always tell whether it's simple edema or whether it is malacia, whether it's non-reversible. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha, the other gotcha. thing I that think it's sense. important is if they have signs of myelopathy, and that's why I like to see them back. So they may be asymptomatic, but if they have signs of myelopathy, if they have upper motor neuron signs, that I think uh, is is important, and and I will decompress them if they are asymptomatic. But if so they are asymptomatic with positive physical signs or intrinsic cord, yes, yes. right. Okay, I don't know if that's right. That's what where I am right now, and I'm sticking to it. That's where I am with my thinking. <laughs> what if it's a healthy 50 year old guy with like you know that has disease from C2 to C7? You know, are you gonna? You know what I mean? Like when it comes down to having to fuse someone a bunch of levels, is I have a hard time swallowing that. Right, but if he's myelopathic, um, yeah. I mean, there are a lot. I mean, maybe he'd be. A, Candidate for laminoplasty or some other, you know, some other maybe motion yeah. stuff. But, but I tell you, level I, disc replacement, Rick. Four level disc replacement. You're, <laughs> you're right, Rick. This whole early myelopathy thing is is a big deal, and I've given more talks on early myelopathy lately because a lot of people like to hear about it because we know that that those with early myelopathy. We're probably we we are able to make them normal. You know, it's hard for us to make advanced myelopathy patients normal. But right. We can no, they don't get better. Yeah. Patients normal. And those are the patients many times that are young and they have this hand dysfunction. And if we wait too long, I mean, they hate their hand dysfunction. They hate the numbness and tingling and dysfunction in their hands. And, and many times if we wait too long, that's irreversible. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for joining us, Rick. Oh, thank you. Super fun. I appreciate I love it. it. All right, guys. Have an awesome day. See you, everybody. Bye. Okay, thanks. Thanks again, Rick. All right, guys. Thank you.